Hello everybody and welcome to the single cell plant dataset tutorial where we will be going through the tutorial given under transcriptomics and if you scroll down to the single cell section it is the analysis of plant sCRNA seq data with Scampi. So you just click on this follow the tutorial button here and it launches the tutorial. Uh, that we will be doing today. So for now, what I would like you to do is to just copy the title of this tutorial and then click outside of the learning rectangle and then create a new history. You can create a new history by clicking on this and then you can rename your history by pasting the title of the tutorial that we will be currently discussing. So, let's go back to the tutorial by clicking on this hat. And in this tutorial, what we will be learning is very similar to the same tools that we learned in the clustering 3K PBMCs with Scampi tutorial, uh, which if you are not yet familiar with that, I recommend that you do that tutorial. Uh, we will be using the same tools, but this time we will be trying to look at a plant data set, one given from this uh, paper from 2019. And in this paper, they have this specific um, clustering that they have uh, discovered, and this particular differentiation pathway where meristemic cells differentiate into trichoblasts as well as potentially into other cell types. So we wish to recapitulate this same type of clustering but using our own tools in Galaxy via the Scampi tool suite. So let us first get started by obtaining our data, which we can do by clicking onto the data section and seeing that we will, will be dealing with essentially two data sets uh, which, one which is a wild type and one which is this short root mutant where essentially the root has been shortened uh, by cutting it and the idea is that it should ideally generate more um, uh, more stem cells in, in some certain cases uh, which will um, show better how these cells differentiate into more mature cell types. So we can simply do this by first of all creating a new history in the tutorial if you haven't done so already. And then we can just copy these two datasets directly from this Zenodo link. So if you want you can click on this Zenodo link and directly see all the files that are associated with this training material but we don't need to use all of these materials. We can just use the um, data sets that we want. Um, this data was originally taken from uh, this GSE um, identifier, 123818. Um, however, I did have to change some of the gene names and I did have to transpose the matrix, which is why um, you have this new extension of fixed names and transposed from the original data set. Um, if you wish to, you can work with the original data set with this um, history, but uh, it is recommended just for the uh, better, more meaningful names later on to use, to use this uh, data matrix. So let's go back to Galaxy and let us just simply copy the text in this file, in this uh, file window, and then go back to our history click on upload data, paste fetch data, and then we just paste the links that we have copied and click start. We can close that and then as soon as these start to go orange, we can start working on the next step. And here they have gone orange and if you're doing a live session with us um, it might actually be quicker to use the shared data from the data libraries which should contain these data sets but I think you should probably use these and uh, not links if you're doing this at home they will maybe 
there would be a real benefit otherwise. So once the data sets are orange, we can begin to apply tags to them. And tags in galaxies are just a way to assign a data set some kind of tag which tells you more information about it and more information about whether or not um, the data that you have processed originated from a certain input data set. And the way that we can propagate these tags such that the output of a given tool shares the same tag as the input of uh, that same tool is to put a hash just before it. So these hashes are very important. So what we want should do now is that we should apply this short root tag and this while type tag to each of our data sets with respect to their initial labels. So let us take a look at these data sets. These data sets are now green, indicating that they have been imported correctly. And notice that the top one here that I have, it has this WT, meaning wild type, and this bottom one here has SHR, meaning short root. This may not, might not be the same for you, so be careful when you apply these tags. And to apply these tags, all you need to do is just click on the data set. And then this should expand the data set to give you a more expanded view of the total number of columns within this data set. So if we go all the way to the right, we see that there are 27,000 columns. Uh, for those of you wondering maybe why it took so long to expand the data set, it's because this is actually quite a large data set. So the preview window took some time to generate. Um, and with this, we can add our tags by clicking on this Edit Dataset Tags button, clicking on it, and typing in hash wt for this one, and then Enter, or just clicking away. And there we go, we have this wt tag now, and the hash means A will be inherited. And then if we go down, we can click on the second one, Again, it might take some time for it to expand just because of how large this data set is. Uh, fortunately, this is behavior very particular to this data set, so we will work on fixing that in the future to make it a bit more expandable. But it is very important that you have these inheritance tags added. It makes the analysis much more easier to understand. There we go. So if we scroll down, we can then click on Edit Dataset Tags and then click there, and this one is SHR. So we add SHR, click away, and it should update the data set very shortly. There we go. And OK, now let's go back to the tutorial. And we click on C Galaxy Training Materials. And now we should have these two data sets uh, having these SHR and WT um, tags added. If you wish to, we can once again expand the data sets to see exactly how many cell barcodes there are and what their gene names are and how many cells are in the data set, how many genes. Uh, but this is stuff that you can do in your own free time if you're just curious about the data set. And this is stuff that will become much more apparent to us once we convert them from their current CSV data, uh, data type towards the AND data data type. Uh, if you're cu curious about what exactly an AND data type is, then please click on this link here, which should redirect you back to the previous tutorial towards the uh, relevant section where it shows you this AND data type where the main matrix is held in this X slot and observations about the cells themselves are kept in a separate table and observations, well, variables are kept in their own table. Um, adjacent to the to the main matrix as well. We just close that for now, and let us do our first step. So, if you're not yet familiar with uh, these um, clickable tools, then you can actually just click on the data itself and fill in the parameters, and uh, this should simplify the um, task of searching for the appropriate tool in the side panel. So, for example, I can just click on this and it loads the correct tool and the correct Galaxy version, which is very neat. Otherwise, if that doesn't work for you because perhaps you're um, experiencing Galaxy from a different domain, 
then you can just type in and data into the tool section and then scroll down and find the appropriate tool here and by clicking on it it should give the exact same tool again so going back to the tutorial we see that we need to choose our format as the tabular csv and tsv file and our annotated data matrix the input file should be both the shr and the wt data sets and i'll show you how to do these in one step right, right now so we click on this and we click on tabular tsv and csv and then we can now click on this multiple data sets to select both data set one and data set two you can hold control to multiple select or shift to select a range and then we hit execute and we just wait for these to become green and this should give us a much more introspectable view to what is happening in these two data sets. And now that enough time has passed, we can see that these are now green and we can just expand this window slightly. And since I'm not really using the sidebar here, I'm just going to minimize this. So we can now look at each individual data set just by clicking on this preview window and seeing that this uh, short root dataset has 1,099 observations, which in the case of single cell means 1,099 cells. And we have around 2,700 variables, which is 27,000 variables, which is the number of genes uh, in the raw input matrix. And if we compare that with the wild type, we see that we have 4,000 cells in the wild type and the exact same number of cells, the exact same number of genes, sorry, as the, as the um, short root. So let's go back to the tutorial. And this, just by looking at the, the observations and the variables, we get an idea of the dimensionality of the data set. We have a thousand observations and we have 27,000 dimensions um, or 27,000 variables, which at some point we will have to reduce to fit into a nice two dimensional graph which shows us which cells better cluster uh, with, with others. So at the moment, these are two separate files as we can see here. Uh, let me just minimize and minimize. We have two separate files and we wish to combine them into one combined AND data file, which is one of the features of AND data is that you can have multiple batches, in this case wild type and short root, uh, within the same file. So we are going to click on this and we are going to concatenate along the observation axis and we are going to concatenate the wild type onto the SHR as the input. So to do this we click on manipulate AND data. We choose the SHR um, dataset as the input, so this should be 3 for me. We are going to concatenate along the observation axis, and we are going to select the wild type, which is 4. Uh, the join method here is not actually that relevant because these have the exact same number of variables, and I know from previous experience that these are the exact same set of variables as well. So we don't actually have to change anything here, but if you are doing a batch merge in the future you may want to consider performing instead of an intersection of variables but a union of variables to get a more um, wider scope of, of variables which could be driving the analysis. So while that is running let us once again take notice of the scheduling such that we can queue the next job on um, even while the input job for the, for the for a particular tool that we wish to run hasn't yet completed. So um, the reason we want to manipulate the AND data again is because at the moment by performing this concatenation uh, all we have ensured is that we've added a new uh, column to our AND data um, observation but um, the observation for the SHR data set is given as a zero and the observations for the wild type cells are given as a 1. And we wish to make this a bit more concrete by changing these to SHR and WT as explicit text. So to do that, we click on Manipulate and Data, and we will be renaming the categories of annotation, and the category that we wish to annotate is Batch, 
and we are going to copy this shrwt and do press control c and then we are going to oops sorry we're going to go back to this uh, click on the, the tool indeed and we are going to rename categories of, of annotation type in batch and shrwt execute and notice that the job has already queued up despite the fact that the previous job has not yet finished this is fine and yes once again notice that order does matter so if you have problems later on where things don't quite look the same as the tutorial it might be because the order in which you concatenated your initial data sets are not the same order as written in this tutorial so please do pay attention uh, that you first selected the SHR dataset and that you concatenated the WT dataset onto it. So we can confirm that our datasets have combined by actually just looking at several things in the new and data object. Um, things such as the general file size, which should be at least the sum of the SHR and WT individual datasets and by looking at the sum of cells, which should again be the sum of SHR and WT cells. So if we just take a quick look at this new data set here, we see that we do indeed have 5826 observations. We have this new batch layer, which tells us specifically which of the original batches a given cell comes from. So we know that roughly uh, 1100 come from the um, SHR batch and 4,000 at least come from the wild type. So what we need to do now is, as in the previous tutorial, we need to filter and um, plot the initial QC metrics of the data set such that we can get a better idea of exactly how we wish to filter this data set, what limits we can impose on it to reduce noise that may appear later in the clustering. So first we click on inspect and manipulate and we wish to calculate quality control metrics. So we say execute. And following that we then ask to plot with Scampi, but making note to copy and paste this keys for accessing variables, which will be the number of genes by counts, i.e. the total number of features uh, in, a, uh, in a given cell, and the total counts, the total number of messenger RNAs in a given cell. So we control C that, and we click on plot with scan P, and we go down, and we say, Ease for accessing genes by counts. So we click on this and then we say click on violin plot. We don't wish to plot all variables, we just want a subset. And the keys that we wish are in genes by counts and total counts. And we wish to group our observations by their individual batches, just to see if there are any significant difference between batches. If there are, then this could make things interesting. So, anything else we need to add? Add a strip plot? Yes. Add a jitter? Yes. Size of jitter points? 0.4. Okay. So here we can go to violent plot attributes. Yes to strip plot. Yes to jitter. And the size should be 0.4. And do we display multiple keys and multiple panels? Yes, we do. So we click on yes, and we leave everything else blank, and then we execute. We should notice now that um, by performing the QC metrics, we have now gained a few more features, such as, what are we, we have 11 layers now, so we have this batch for each um, cell, we have the log n genes by counts, log total counts, uh, n genes by counts, and percentage of counts in the top 100 genes, percentage of counts in the top 200 genes, and so forth. Um, so the QC metrics generates many, many um, 
types of annotations that we can use later on for further analysis. But right now we are just interested in the violin plot. And once it's ready, we can simply view it by clicking on the eye symbol, like so. So here we see this violin plot here, and we just zoom in slightly. So this is number of genes by counts, which is the total number of features um, of a given cell in a given batch. Each dot here is an individual cell, and don't worry so much about the, the um, spread on the x-axis. This is just a randomness added so that no two cells uh, overlap each other. They, they still do, but it's just more random if they don't, so we can better see. Uh, the most defining features of a uh, violin plot are knowing exactly where the most uh, counts are distributed. So here we see uh, most of our cells have around 2,000 genes describing them, which is good. And we have a few which uh, describe of at least 12,000 genes uh, characterizing a cell. So you might feel like these are outliers that we should get rid of, and in most cases you would be correct, but I believe in the paper that we are replicating, they kept them in, so we are also going to keep them in. If we look at the wild type, we see it's a bit more denser because we noticed that there are um, at least four times as many cells, and we also noticed that the average number of features is also um, slightly higher. You may think it's double the initial, but it is this gain here is marginable. These data sets are very comparable. If we look at the total number of counts, again, we have a lot more cells uh, in the wild type than the um, short root. Uh, most of these are distributed towards the, I would guess that's about a, maybe a thousand to 5,000 um, total messenger RNAs in the given cell. And unfortunately, we do have a significant number of outliers that we can't just simply cut them out and call it a fair analysis. So we are likely going to keep most of these outliers in just so that we can um, get a few more specific clusters and get a few more specific cell types. So this should be the same um, violin plot that you see in your, in, in your data. So we are now going to filter our data using similar metrics that you can de derive from the divided plot. So we definitely want cells that have at least um, 100 uh, minimum number of genes expressed in a given cell. That seems at least fair. And we also want genes that are, that are expressed in at least two cells. If a gene is only expressed in one cell, we we, we do not care for it that much. So the sensitivity here is actually reasonably high, uh, but this is what is required to replicate um, the same analysis in the paper. If you wish, you can play with these later after this tutorial, increase these thresholds, and I can show you how to do that in a very easy manner um, later on. But for now, let's just stick to, to, to these limits given here. Uh, what we also wish to do is we wish to filter out any cells which have a number of features less than 12,000. And we also wish to filter out any cells which has a total library size uh, less than 120,000. Notice that this is 12,000 and this is 120,000. So be very careful when you do this. So, okay, filter. We are filtering cells uh, by the minimum number of genes expressed, which will be 100. Minimum number of genes is 100, exactly. So we click Execute. And then while that is running, you can go back to Filter again. And this time we are doing Filter Genes by minimum number of cells too. So filter cells, no, we want to filter genes. Minimum number of cells expressed, at least two. Click on execute. And then we wish 
can manipulate the object directly by copy this key to filter the number of genes by counts to less than 12,000. So we are filtering observations or variables. We are filtering observations. Key to filter is number of genes by counts. And we are filtering to less than 12,000. Uh, make sure that is less than. Exactly. OK. And then we do the same for the upper limit for the total library size. So we copy this total counts. And we click on Manipulate and Data, and we once again click on Filter, Observations, by Key, Total Count, Number, less than or less than or equal to, we should matter so much, 120,000. And Execute. So if we take a look at this data set, we can see we have 5623 observations and 23102 variables. And this is exactly what we expect to see. Yes. So what we want to do now is we wish to preserve the original matrix just by freezing it into a spare slot. And this will help later on potentially, not in this analysis, but potentially in a later analysis, where you want to perform some kind of rank gene assignment and you wish to uh, use the original data set but to perform this which can sometimes be useful so we're just going to click on freeze the current state into the raw attribute and execute so any further changes we can then undo them by restoring from this from this raw slot What we wish to do next is then known as confounder removal, where if you consult the video at the time spot given, uh, it tells you of the uh, types of confounder removal that you wish to get rid of, um, such as unwanted biological variation, unwanted um, amplification effects, uneven uh, cell capture rates, several several factors which uh, we wish to regress out of the analysis through a fair normalization and we do that by simply clicking on the normalize and by setting a target sum to 10,000 so this will normalize all cells to a target sum of 10,000 transcripts per cell so we click on execute and then we wish to perform a log transformation on the data. Uh, this is to ensure that um, this is to ensure that um, large differences between in, in a gene expression profile are not too drastic enough to completely um, drive um, a further separation of a data type which uh, does not need to be so greatly um, separated. Essentially we are looking more at gradients rather than absolute differences and by performing a log transformation we compress uh, this variability into a, into, a, into a tighter space essentially. Okay, then we wish to regress out unwanted sources of variation. So the main one that we have in our um, data set here is simply the library size. So we wish to go to remove, confounder, regress out, and we click on total counts. And uh, what we also wish to do is we wish to scale the data to unit variance. So this is just to ensure that the mean expression of um, 
the mean expression of a gene is not a contributing factor, it is more the variability of the gene that we care about. We're now looking at the at gene dispersion rather than absolute gene expression. And by doing this, we should have a much nicer data set that we can use for dimension reduction. So if you don't know, not know what dimension reduction is, then we explain this much better in the introduction video. So I do implore you to take a peek at this, specifically at the time point given at the bottom, 1346. If this is not automatically linked, uh, then please just jump to that time spot of 1346 and it should tell you more about dimensionality reduction. But essentially what we are trying to do is we are trying to perform a principal component analysis, i.e. performing a rotation of the unit axes of the data and uh, by doing so finding the axes which have the most variation of them and selecting them by order of most variation to least variation. And we don't wish to select we don't wish to select all twenty thousand um, gene axes, or not gene axes, but PCA axes, uh, but maybe the just the most top forty relevant ones. So this single step alone, PCA, very powerful, uh, gives you a dimension reduction from twenty thousand to forty, which is a phenomenal amount of reduction without losing much variability in the data. Uh, the components themselves are uh, linear combinations of genes, so it's never explicitly describing one gene, it's a, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a linear combination of several genes, um, some which have more impact than others, and you can get these loadings um, using Scampi, but you should consult the previous tutorial uh, for that, since we are not going to do that in this tutorial. Uh, once we perform a PCA, we can then perform a further dimension reduction to get a actual plottable space of two dimensions. And in single cell RNA seq, you can do this via UMAP or TSNE. Now, UMAP is the new golden child of dimensional reduction in single cell because you can project new data onto it. But TSNE is still very good, so if you want, you can try both just to see how they fare. Uh, and you should hopefully get robust um, projections of the data in both. Uh, but for, for now, in this tutorial, we are just going to be using uh, the UMAP projection. So first, let's do a PCA. So we click on Cluster, Infer, and Inspect, and then we perform... Um, here we go, TLPCA, and we will be using the top, uh, sorry, we will be using a full PCA using RPAC wrapper, okay, so type of PCA is full PCA, and the SVD solver will be this RPAC, so we click execute, and then we wish to generate a neighborhood graph of cells so that we can perform clustering on them later on. Uh, for those of you not really familiar with a neighborhood graph, I do um, ask you to once again look at the introduction video, specifically at time point 1340, which should give you a better idea of exactly how to generate a graph of cells and how this can be used for clustering later on. Um, so for now, we're just going to compute this neighborhood. So PP neighbors, and the size of the local neighborhood should be 10, and we will only be using 40 principal components. So we computed 50, but we only need 40. So then we click Execute. We're using the UMAP method of connectivity. And then we will be generating the UMAP. So let us, let us generate a UMAP embedding. And we are going to 
keep all these defaults, uh, especially number of components to be two, and I re execute. And these steps here are just for generating the uh, coordinates, I guess you could say, for these embeddings. But to actually see the embeddings, we have to plot them. So let us plot with Scampy first the PCA, group them by batch, and we will be using this rainbow color scheme in the plot attributes because sometimes the default uh, colors don't quite work so well. So let us let us do that. So plot PCA. Mm. Plot PCA. If you can't see it, you can just type in PCA. Here we go. PL PCA. Uh, the keys for annotations shall be batch and on the plot attributes. Select, I believe, the colors to use for categorical annotations. So this one should be. It can actually be any color, just please don't choose a default one because the default one has been known to not produce such nice colors. And while that is loading, let us also plot the UMAP embedding. So again, same sort of settings, batch, uh, a rainbow color scheme, and okay. So plot UMAP, keys for annotations, we just have batch for now. We don't wish to show edges, we don't push arrows, and on the plot attributes, select the categorical annotations to be rainbow and then we plot and if we wait long enough we should see eventually these two plot uh, data sets go green and from there we can have a better look at exactly how clustered our data is So if we have a look now at our PCA and the UMAP, we can actually take a look at them side by side by clicking on this Enable Disable Scratchbook button. So we click on that and we click on our PCA and it loads in this nice resizable window which I will place like so. Then I click away and then I click on Plot UMAP and I also resize this so that these two are nicely side by side. And we can see that the PCA has some variability, variability in both axes, which is expected for such a complex data set. And we also see that the short root batch and the wild type batch um, are actually quite nicely mixed together, meaning that there shouldn't be such great batch effects. If we look at a UMAP for these two um, batches, uh, the short read and the wild type appear to overlap but in different sections hinting that there is likely an overlap of cell types but not necessarily of the exact same cells for the for the other majority of the cells so for example the wild type appears to have uh, more of this central cluster of cells here than the than the short read so let us have a look at the training again and here again, we can just see very similar types of scatterings um, as we have discovered in our um, tutorials themselves. But what we now need to do is we need to actually find the exact same cell types that was given in the original paper. So in the original paper, there is this specific heat map. Uh, well, it's a heat map of sorts, but it's actually a dot plot uh, showing you the intensities of a given set of genes here at the bottom uh, expressed in different clusters. Now, they had approximately 15 clusters, including zero, and you can see that they found specific um, cell markers. Well, specific cell markers were lit up for specific clusters. 
um, in such a way that these clusters were unique to those specific cell types. So for example, trichoblasts appears to be extremely illuminated in this cluster 10, but nowhere else. Whereas we have, for example, columella, QC, and NC, these three cell types appear to all be localized within the same cluster 11. So hopefully we can uh, recapitulate the same sort of pattern by performing our own um, Scampi analysis. So to do this, we go and we click on this cluster in trajectories and embed, and we will be using the Leiden clustering method. And I encourage you to once again take a look at the introduction to single cell video, just to refresh your mind on exactly how Leiden um, clustering works. Uh, it is very similar to Louvain clustering, but Leiden has the added benefit that it um, deals better with disjointed parts of the graph. So we click on this. We will be using the latest 20, and we will be using Leiden. And I believe the coarseness we said was going to be 0.35. So 0.35. This is something that you have to sort of discover yourself through trial and error which level of coarseness will give you the best sort of clustering. And we click Execute. And we can disable the scratchbook if we want to. Yes. Okay. And this will perform the actual clustering, we, but we wish to see this plotted as a UMAP. So we are going to copy the Leiden and the batch as observed types. Plot with Scampi, and we're going to use the output of 23. Let me expand this window slightly to UMAP. Keys will be Leiden and Batch. Um, I believe we have some further plot attributes, which is we want the legend to be on the data, and we want the legend to be at size 14, and we will be using the rainbow color scheme. So plot attributes. of the legend should be on the data and it should be 14. So we click execute. And this should give us these two nice side-by-side -side plots. Um, well, in our case, the data will be actually on the the legend will be actually on the data itself. Um, and this should give us 13 unique clusters. This isn't the same as the 15 in the original paper, but it is enough for us to find the correct cell types, as you will see later. So if we just take a quick look now at the Enable Scratchbook, we plot the UMAP, oops, let's just close the other one. So here we have the labels actually on the data. Uh, for example, the short root, which I think is the purple one in this case, probably not the best to uh, have it on this particular uh, batch setting. But here we have the individual cluster identifiers and we have uh, is there a cluster zero? I don't believe there is. There is a cluster zero. So we have 13 individual clusters, uh, which we don't know anything about them. All we know is that there are 13 clusters that the cells have fallen into. So now we need to identify specifically which ones are the ones that were identified in the paper. So let's go back to the tutorial and we are going to be generating a dot plot. So this will be the same dot plot from the paper, but this time doing it within Scampi and seeing whether we can get the same patterns and same groupings of cells within the same types of clusters. So one thing you will need is this list of uh, marker genes. Uh, this is taken straight from the paper itself. Um, 
literally from this this graphic here. I didn't get all of them because perhaps some of them are filtered out in the initial analysis. Um, so I'm only keeping the ones that we have detected so far. And what we want to do is to do a dot plot and a subset of variables. So let's do that. Click on plot with scampi. We will use the latest and we will type in dot plot. And we will not be using all variables, we will be using a subset of variables. And I will just paste those in there. And I don't think we need to do any group. Oh, sorry, we do. The grouping should be the, the Leiden. Let's just double check that. Uh, yes, this should be the Leiden, which will be the vertical grouping. And we will get to this part later on. But this part is essentially to help um, shape the help shape the categories. So what all this does is it creates specific gene groups where we identify that all genes that fall within this group of genes are called columella and those that fall within this group is called QC and so forth. It's just a way of adding annotation to the plot. So it is a little bit painstaking to do but let's just brave our way through it. So we have nine, yes, we will we'll be using the raw data, and columella is zero to five. Okay, so nine categories, insert group, zero, five, columella. Insert another group, go back, six, nine, QC. Insert another group. 10, 11, NC. Um, endodermis is 12 to 17. These are just physical indexes to um, demarcate these. These genes, 18 to 23. 18 to 23, got text. And the trigger blasts, 24 to 29. And trigger blasts, 30 to 34. Custom figure size, no. We'll keep everything else the same. Execute. So if we take a look at the dot plot, we see now that we have our own dot plot for these given marker genes, and we can compare it with the original from the from the original paper. Um, so let's go to this dot plot here, view it in a separate tab, and let's go to our own dot plot and middle click to view that in a separate tab. So this is ours, and this is the original. So notice that columella, QC, and NC all share one given uh, cluster here, which is the same as given in our reproduction. Uh, notice that endodermis, cortex, and atricoblasts have uh, different clusters from um, everything else. So atricoblast, cortex, and endodermis, these are all localized within their own clusters. And we have good expression for trichoplast, xylem, and VC. So in general, this has been a pretty good reproduction of the paper. And we can further 
Um, we can further show this by annotating the names with, with new names. So um, we can actually put the correct labels onto the desired clusters um, to give a nice um, plot that we can use for, um, for uh, publication. So let's have a look. Manipulate and data. What we wish to do is to rename categories of annotation. And we will be taking these copy and pasting it there. Oops, sorry, not that's the key. This key should be uh, the Leiden. And these are the new categories. Yes. So then we execute that on our latest data object. And then we plot it. So plot it scampy on the data 14 rainbow. New map. Key for annotations is Leiden. We're not really concerned with batch, so I will uh, I will not add it. Although you can if you want, but. I'm just going to put Leiden for now since I find this more interesting. And plot attributes. We want the legend on the data. The legend size should be 14. Perhaps that's a bit big. If you want to make it smaller, you can. And I'll be using rainbow for the categorical annotation groups. And we should be using data input set 26, which we are. So now if we have a look at this new plot, we see that we get um, the same clusters as before, but now relabeled such that we have the columella QC and NC contained within this cluster region here, a trichoblast, trichoblast, endodermis, and cortex. And so from this we can possibly infer um, a kind of differentiation from this central cluster one. And if we are to look back at the original um, clustering giving in the paper, we see that cluster one is quite likely to be this meristemic, meristemic um, cell type, which then differentiates later into this trichoblast trajectory pathway. So this is um, as far as the original paper went in terms of the determining the clusters, but we can ourselves um, take it further and um, perform the actual trajectory analysis by um, using the same data set in a different tutorial. Uh, I leave this as an exercise for keen users who wish to try to do this using um, the excellent um, single cell materials in the R, R Studio and Jupyter Notebook libraries. Um, you can perform this within Galaxy using Scampi, however, it should be noted that you would get a slightly different trajectory analysis. So it is recommended to use the trajectory tools found in SoRed. And I greatly encourage you to follow this um, tutorial to try and replicate it. If you wish to play with this particular tutorial um, a little, little bit more using um, slightly greater control over what the input parameters are, well, there is a workflow available. Uh, just simply search for SCRNA plant analysis and it's actually attached to this, um, to this tutorial um, in the main Use Galaxy workflow. And you can form your own analysis by feeding it, you know, your own different um, data sets, setting a different level of um, resolution for light and clustering, different input parameters for filtering, and seeing what kind of um, plots that you will eventually get. So this is completely automated within Galaxy. You just run this workflow, feed it the inputs that you would like, and um, you can regain um, new insights into the same data set 
hopefully you should get the same sort of clustering, which will prove that it's quite a robust data set and that your analysis is, is uh, correct over different parameters, which is always great to see. Uh, but maybe you get something slightly, slightly different. So I encourage you to play and to um, please leave some feedback on the actual content if you see any changes that need to be um, taken care of. And uh, thank you for completing this tutorial.